Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, this is session number 38. Unbelievable, 38. Uh, in our series on uh, what is a library if the building is closed and started out as libraries in reaction and then libraries in response and then libraries in recovery that's where we we think we are we may be a little bit presumptuous on the recovery part but certain aspects of it are definitely in recovery as we try to imagine what what the new environment looks like even as we are still responding to more, more events, uh, more the, the variety of crises that has befallen uh, the planet over the last year, certainly. Uh, today, we're gonna explore offline internet, uh, a really fascinating topic and an important approach to connectivity. We are the Gigabit Libraries Network, we are partnering with the International Federation of Library Associations Institutions, which is hosting and recording this session, uh, which will be posted on the pandemic response page at Gigabit Libraries within a day or so, maybe even later today, uh, check back. Uh, where all the prior sessions, all prior 37 sessions are linked uh, to, uh, they're now residing on YouTube and they're available uh, in uh, a range of languages, as well as uh, the uh, closed caption. So this is an effort to make these more accessible to more people in more places, even as we try to contextualize this so that it may be relevant for specific interests or just kind of a general thing. Um, towards that end, uh, we're hoping to make these more searchable uh, and uh, more relevant to, to more pursuits. On, on one hand, this is a, a docu documentation of the, the path because we've, we've convening, been convening almost every week and just following the progression of the, of the, uh, of the virus and the disease related to that uh, as things have happened. Uh, we have outstanding speakers today uh, known to us here, uh, Laura, Bruce, and Gregoire. Uh, we'll in introduce them uh, a little bit later. They're here to uh, tell us this story that we've set up today. But as usual, we want to uh, uh, touch on, you know, our COVID report, I guess we can call it here, in now 2021. And, and so the news is, is better and worse at the same time. Uh, this is a graph from a week ago uh, showing this dramatic decline from somewhere around January the 6th, I think, uh, ironically, uh, we peaked at 300,000 cases reported on, on one day. Uh, and it's just been falling like a rock uh, since then. But actually, it's slowing now. We're starting to see this uptick. And that could very well be a sign that people have become more complacent uh, or maybe they've and become enthusiastic. enthusiastic about the uh, the falling off of the rates and are, and are back out uh, mingling and sharing uh, germs. <clears throat> well, we hope not, but you know, it wouldn't be surprising. Uh, so the vaccine news is really good. I mean, it's just astonishing that these vaccines have been actually created, synthesized and mass produced in in just an unbelievable amount of time. There's, there's still no vaccines for AIDS and you know, even the common cold is, which is a coronavirus as I understand it, there's no vaccine for that. They, they just haven't come up with them. They're, they're difficult to do, but in this case they've managed to do it and just, just in time. The not so good news is that uh, these uh, viruses are excellent at uh, shape-shifting shape to uh, avoid uh, being you know, trapped, cornered, uh, negated, whatever. And so we're seeing lots of variants showing up and it's, we don't really know how uh, infectious they are, how lethal they may be. And uh, well, 
well, we're just hopeful. So we're just going to have to watch that and see how that plays out. I think the point on that is that the more cases that are out there, the more opportunities there are for these viruses to mutate. I mean, they already have a lot of opportunities, you know, trillions of mutations, but then they just have to hit the right one. The odds are pretty much in their favor, but we'll just have to see. But until everyone is basically uh, vaccinated or we've achieved a level of uh, uh, herd immunity, so-called, uh, it, it's going to keep increasing the chances that something's going to happen. This fellow here, uh, Larry Brilliant, was uh, one that tracked down an, another deadly virus. He was part of the group that, uh, that found and eliminated smallpox, uh, tracked it down in India and, and ended it as an active uh, virus in the population. Notwithstanding that, uh, we've, we've touched on the, the wider context of crisis, which of course is uh, planetary warming and how that is triggering a whole range of severe uh, weather events that are just, they go, they're more mind boggling every time we turn around. Uh, you know, century events, 500 year events they're becoming coming at us you know every couple of years uh, these temperatures in texas they just reported that they were within five minutes of losing the entire grid a, ca a catastrophic catastrophic failure of the, of the texas uh, electricity grid uh, one can only imagine what the implications of that would be of uh 25 approaching 30 million people uh, without electricity for a month, just unthinkable, but yet it was that close. Um, just to add to the, I don't know what to call it optimism, but uh, so I won't, uh, this is just uh, a story that came out yesterday, the slowing of the, uh, 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 the Atlantic uh, current that takes warm water up the east coast of the US and across the North Atlantic and over to Europe, which how helps Europe keep from freezing because it's really far north uh, uh, lat latitudinally, but because of this warm airflow, it, it moderates that temperature. This is, they're saying this is the slowest it's been in a thousand years. So the effects of, of Climate change are not anticipated to relent anytime soon. The, the actions being taken to, to mitigate that or even much less reverse that uh, seem to be nowhere close to being adequate to address the, the challenge. So if we're not all thinking in terms of uh, adaptation strategies, what kind of effects this will have you know, right where we live? I mean, more people dislocated, more people in distress, uh, uh, times of crisis, these big weather events, people seek out libraries for shelter, for, for information communication, maybe even food, uh, uh, electricity. So we're encouraging libraries everywhere to increase the level of resilience, you could say, for how they can respond, because people are just going to show up whether you invite them or not and they're gonna be looking for help. So having backup power is kind of one thing. Having an alternate uh, uh, strategy for connectivity is yet another one. And uh, actually our topic today, we'll, we'll touch on that. This is the context for the offline internet as we would uh, offer it to you is the, the Partnership for Public Access. Uh, I don't have the link on here. It's p4pa.net and uh, the partnership offers this kind of a three approach strategy that would accommodate the digital services needs of, of uh, almost anybody, almost anywhere. That being the public access centers, most, most common to what we've been talking about here, libraries as, as digital hubs of, of, uh, of access and content and communities everywhere. Uh, last week we had uh, the focus was on community networks. So how uh, the technologies have gotten less complicated, less expensive, and more people are able to, uh, more communities are able to uh, build their own networks, uh, especially in places where the market has chosen not to provide services, 
uh, because of the presumed lack of profitability, which is driving most of the infrastructure investment. So that's a kind of a, a build out, build in strategy. We're, we're advocating that governments should build out a node in every community uh, should have a, a high performance endpoint uh, for ideally for a library or a school or you know these key community institutions. And then off of which the community itself can then uh, build its own area network. The third element, which is what we're gonna talk about today is offline internet. And that is situations where the internet has not yet reached, or maybe it has, but it's been lost or interrupted or is unstable. So there's a range of strategies we'll touch on here momentarily. Uh, I just wanted to list the, uh, the, the partners in the P4PA.net. Uh, you can see there's a declaration there, uh, these certain principles, as well as these different strategies or approaches to a comprehensive strategy. Uh, this, this is a, a great group of, of organizations that are working hard to uh, uh, achieve, well, universal, at least public internet access as a, as a baseline standard for, uh, for uh, everybody having some kind of access to digital uh, equity. So with that, I will uh, turn this over to uh, Laura and Bruce uh, at uh, ASU, Arizona State University. Just an amazing institution. If you, if you don't know Arizona State, it, it's enormous school and they do extraordinary things across the widest range of, of fields. And this is yet another one that they're leading on. Uh, the, the library there, the ASU library, hosted the uh, offline internet consortium a few years ago. And it's been growing since then. And, and, then. and uh, uh, Solar Spell, the project, and, and Bibliothèque Sans Frontières are charter members of that. And they each have their own stories, and we're going to hear those now. So thanks very much for your patience. Uh, Laura, take it away. Let me stop sharing. You're up. OK, great. OK, we tested this, but I also just want to make sure this is You're good. All right, great. Thank you so much, Don, uh, both for inviting us and, and hosting us. And thanks, everyone, for being on this call. And I'm hoping to tell you a little bit about Solar Spell's story. And so what is Solar Spell? Uh, the acronym SPELL stands for Solar Powered Educational Learning Library. But we think of ourselves as more than a library. And it's an educational initiative at Arizona State University, combining appropriate technology, relevant content, and local capacity building. And we do that through a train the trainer approach and building local skills through in-field partnerships as well. So taking a step back to be able to tell that story, my story actually of Solar Spell came about about 10 years ago when I was able to carry out research around the world to really dig in on this um, topic that was puzzling me and frustrating me, I have to say, that uh, technology, be it a laptop or a tablet, was being handed to teachers around the world with no training, no support, by the way, no electricity, no internet, and they were being told, transform how you teach. Go. By the way, your job is on the line with no thought through of what does success look like? How are you going to get from A to B or more accurately A to Z? And so this wasn't just happening in the Solomon Islands or Papua New Guinea or Senegal or Haiti or any of the places that I was researching it. It was happening globally. Ministries of education were just, you know, uh, declaring year of the tablet or year of the computer and when I did my research, I also discovered that the United States had done this 40 years prior. So this is a pattern we don't seem to learn. But the thing that truly puzzled me when I went and talked with teachers all over the world was, yes, they said, this isn't working for us. This is not the right way to do it. But they were all, without hesitation, pro-technology. We want to figure out how to do this right, because this is the future for our students. So I audaciously thought maybe I could be part of the solution of, of figuring out a different and a better way forward. 
So the challenge, of course, looks like this in schools that have no infrastructure, um, lack of educational materials, teachers who with their lack of educational materials and lack of access to new information or different information or different ways of thinking about teacher teaching or different support to think about any of those things, of course, revert to what they know, which is memorization and regurgitation. That's how they learned. And there are millions and millions upon millions of schools in the world that have this same situation. So how do we change this? Well, I also want to throw some statistics at you, but these are big, big numbers. So the United Nations estimates that half the world's population has never connected to the internet. It gets worse because I'm gonna let you know that the UN's definition of connected to the internet or an internet user is if you've connected once in the last three months. So imagine someone sitting at a cyber cafe 12 weeks ago connecting once to the internet or on their phone is considered in the same group as those of us who are hyper-connected and on this call right now watching a webinar. But those of you who are familiar with having limited internet or having it extremely expensive or paying for it by the bite, you know that in the, in the developing world, in the you know, resource poor or income poor parts of the world, the internet, there is no such concept as unlimited. So you are paying for it by the bite. It's expensive, it's precious. You ration your use, you decide what to use it for, and you're not using it to go search for educational content that you don't know exists. So this is a statistic that talks about access, half the world not connected. I actually think that that's the wrong thing to focus on because this isn't a problem. So if we're going to build internet ready skills or information literacy or library ready skills, could we start with the schools? Well, unfortunately, the statistics there are even more grim. Uh, back in 2014, the International Telecommunications Union, the UN body that estimates these things, came out with an estimate that over 90% of schools across the entire developing world, this is the Latin America, Caribbean, Asia, Africa, don't have internet connectivity. There's a lot of reasons for this. I also want to point out that they haven't reported this since 2014. So the numbers could be better. I, my hunch is that this was such a, a problematic uh, statistic because nobody is actually out pounding the pavements to figure out which schools have internet and which don't. Um, we don't have a, a perfect statistic. But again, this isn't even really the problem. This is about access. So they also estimate, you know, turning their, in the next paragraph, I think, that this is more getting at the issue, I think. 90% of teachers at these schools that don't have internet connectivity don't have the digital skills themselves, the information literacy, the internet ready, the, the search skills, et cetera. They aren't better equipped, in other words, to build those 21st century skills in their students than they would be if the internet just magically appeared at their school overnight. Because I want to be clear, these are skills that need to be built, muscles that need to be flexed. When the internet shows up, people don't just magically have search skills. They don't just magically have information literacy skills, in, especially in, in non-reading cultures. A colleague of mine from the Pacific Islands put it more eloquently than I ever could have. She said, we come from a non-reading culture. How do we develop that? It doesn't happen overnight. Anyway, I wanted to, to start working through the schools because I'm an educator, but these are daunting statistics. So I felt we need to do something very different. Well, unfortunately, um, what I read by turning the page again in the ITU report is a recommendation that improving ICT skills begins at school because young people and especially teenagers tend to be more ICT savvy. They learn more quickly. We know this about you know, anyone who's seen a four-year-old looking at a tablet knows that they can pick up that skill much quicker. This is not getting at the problem. This is repeating things that we already know didn't work. So this is making the presumption that just because kids can learn things more quickly, we should just outsource it to them and leave their education in their hands. But that's not fair to the, to the kids. It's not fair to the teachers. And it doesn't actually work. And it's a, it's a logical fallacy um, that we've seen from throwing technology at a problem and thinking that that was going to magically solve things. This is a human skills development problem, not a technology problem. 
So I, I again want to come back to this argument that looking at access alone is the wrong way to look at things because access alone isn't, isn't going to be sufficient. We are not born with internet ready skills. Those of us who have been using the internet for 35, 20, 25 to 30 years, um, take for granted all of the skill sets that we've developed over time. And this is human nature. So that's actually how I feel humans progress is that they can take for granted anything they don't have to think about. One more example, if you've never needed to think where the electricity comes from when you flick on the, the light, you don't think about that, right? So, so we internet users forget that these are actual skill sets that we're talking about in order for the internet to be meaningfully used to have the empowering aspects that we think that it could have for others who are not yet using the internet. But just like libraries still need librarians, schools still need teachers, first time internet users still need mentors or teachers or, or coaches or whatever facilitators to help build those skills and, and you know, with giving direction. I also feel very strongly that access is unrealistic right now because if you went into the um, pandemic not having internet access, no new infrastructure is being built out during this pandemic. And in fact, for a few years before that, the growth rate of internet users had actually been steadily declining since about 2016. I haven't seen statistics since the pandemic, but my hunch is that it went down significantly. And then my third point about access is that Focusing only on access is actually irresponsible. It's dangerous. Whew, so why do I say that? Well, so about a year and a half ago, the World Wide Web celebrated its 30th anniversary. And its founder, uh, the man widely credited with inventing the hyperlink and coming up with the World Wide Web, did not celebrate. He actually started a movement to uh, make the case that the World Wide Web has become a wild, wild west, a haven for scammers, haters, and criminals, and let's take it back. But unfortunately, because it has also become this, I want to point out that this is unfortunately some of the internet that gets exposed to people who are using it for the first time. So, 100% of the people that we at Solar Spell have surveyed around the world as we've gone and out and asked uh, people, you know, if you have internet in your village, in your community where you live, what is it used for? Without hesitation, 100% of them say Facebook. And then we start to hear the problem of fake news in their community and how could we possibly fight it? And I have seen, before we were even giving these interviews and surveys, I have seen this. We have you know, been in places where we were actually connecting people because Bruce and I had been focused on internet connectivity before we took our steps back and, and started working on offline internet and library. Um, and everywhere we go, it's about Facebook. And there's a reason for that. Facebook is meeting an information or communication need that we can't deny, right? You, you want to know about your uncle having a baby and your cousin getting married and it is a lifeline of communication. But unfortunately, it is also a uh, private sector ad-based revenue model that allows organizations to turn a blind eye when they're making a profit to things like hate speech, extremist speech, et cetera. Um, I can't really come up with a better example of how that played out in the United States with an angry mob on January 6th, whipped up to destructive frenzy, fed a set steady diet of social media with lies, anger, hatred, etc. cetera. Um, but I have a couple of other examples of around the world where it's taking place. Um, the genocide in Myanmar, meddling in Ugandan elections, and you know there are other social media um, as well. Um, and it gets harnessed by those who are savvier about how to use the internet. And this is what is consumed by new users of the internet. What we're seeing therefore is that people don't move beyond social media. If they have a sip or a, you know, a bite of internet connectivity, they're getting on social media and they don't build other skills. They're not moving beyond it. So, and this is, you know, a problem because there are bad things that happen online and these are things that can only happen online that I've got on this slide. Um, and who do they happen to? Well, by definition, 
to the newest users or the most inexperienced users, or might I say children, the most vulnerable. So um, then I wanna, I wanna ask, aren't we doing better in the United States? No, unfortunately we're not. So I have a colleague who studies the use of the internet among teenagers in California. And the best predictor of whether these teenagers were able to carry out a search that could count as research, could tell whether a site was trustworthy enough to give their personal information to, or could tell whether news was real or fake, was whether their parents had these skills. So we're also not teaching these things very well in school, but there's no reason that we couldn't. It's just that if you're introducing the internet to a location where by definition, the grownups don't have these skill sets, real news from fake, is it trustworthy? Can I actually research to get information that I'm interested in? Things like information literacy, then we're doing a disservice by merely introducing the internet because these skills again, don't develop magically overnight. So I truly, honestly, firmly believe that we can make it so that offline is better than online in certain circumstances, in places where people are just coming online for the first time, and certainly in school settings. Because again, if kids are the most vulnerable to the pernicious things that you can find online, and they are very targeted as well, let's instead make a place that is welcoming, safe, relevant, where people can see themselves in the information that's available, that's localized, that is education only, so that let's say teachers can feel very safe about kids surfing to any corner of this place. And why not also make it inspirational so that kids can dream beyond the village that they live in that they haven't yet experienced. And I call this place a library, <laughs> even though it's without walls, this is a digital library. So how do we build a reading culture and information literacy culture? Uh, let's make empowering use of the internet culture. We do this by, by creating it offline. And I know that we can already do this because we've shown that we can do this. Wherever there's a challenge, there's an opportunity. We can build information literacy and internet ready skills in offline settings um, because we've been doing it in multiple places around the world. And as an educator, I also want to, you know, just be clear that I believe education is actually at the root, at the basis of all of the other long lasting quality of life improvements. If we want to see long term health, uh, quality of life, health improvements, education improvements, you know, even entrepreneurial improvements, we need to have education as a basis. Speaking of that, I also, we have a dual mission at Solar Spell to involve our ASU students. So we're focused on education globally, as well as right here at home. And so Solar Spell itself has been um, student designed and built as part and parcel of the experiential learning classes that Bruce and I lead at ASU and students are involved in every aspect of Solar Spell, be that through content curation, anything, making videos, writing software code, building the solar spells um, to conducting research in the field alongside us. So up to now, we have um, 365 solar spells in the field, just about twice that number of people trained on how to use them. And again, we follow a train the trainer model. So they are the ones bringing the libraries back to their communities and introducing the libraries locally. And that has happened so far in eight different countries um, around the world. If you like maps, this is a geographical representation of where we've been working. I want to just quickly mention that one of the ways that we've been addressing the long term training and support is through a partnership with the Peace Corps. And that um, has been fruitful since we actually first started going to the field in terms of Peace Corps volunteers truly um, move locations. They live in remote rural places around the world. The picture you're seeing here is in Vanuatu. So they're in remote rural islands across Vanuatu. They're paired with a local teacher counterpart. They help build not just tech skills, but what I'm going to call the information literacy skills, the library ready skills in the communities where they're living for two years. And that is sort of a secret sauce that you know, we've, we've got, as you're seeing in this picture, solar powered, it's appropriate technology. 
relevant content so that it's localized to the Pacific Islands um, and then long-term training and support on not just how to use the technology, that's the easy part, but how to build these long-term uh, human infrastructure or human capacity um, skills of information literacy and internet readiness. So we think that this uh, partnership is a big deal, not only because Peace Corps told us it's the first time that it's bubbled up from the field, volunteers and posts told headquarters, we think this is a good thing that all volunteers should have around the world, um, but it's also one of only 15 strategic partnerships that Peace Corps has ever signed. So we're, we're extremely proud of it and excited for it. And when things do return to normal after COVID, uh, looking forward to really capitalizing on it, but it is not complete. So we could never reach the 50% of the world that is offline simply through one partner. So we have also started working with UNHCR um, and uh, IRC, Plan International, and working to get these libraries and build these skills within refugee camp schools as well. Planning to pilot in Ethiopia uh, later this year because a library can you know, go beyond uh, primary and secondary education, of course. When Bruce and I were in Juba, South Sudan last year, or was that now a year and a half ago because of COVID, sorry. Uh, we also saw a need with um, the nursing and midwifery schools there being completely offline, not having enough uh, books, textbooks, even for these students. And yet they all had smartphones. And so um, we set about developing a nursing and midwifery library that could meet the needs of, there are actually numerous nursing and midwifery schools across East Africa that struggle with this same lack of resources. So not only are we able to meet um, a need for textbooks, but imagine if all you had was out of date textbooks that you had access to. But now you have access to interactive content that can go much further than the one sentence or the one paragraph or chapter in your textbook and make something really alive and colorful and move and get you to really understand it much better than just memorizing it. So we're very excited to be um, nearly ready to pilot that nursing library we also hope before the end of this year. Similarly, it was an ASU student who walked into my office, she's, she's pictured here, Sarah, who told me about this global phenomenon of donated medical equipment that never arrives with user manuals. So in the poorer countries, the vast majority of the medical equipment that they rely on comes donated from the US and Western Europe, and nobody thinks about the, the manuals. So, so much of this equipment sits unused and it's, it's something that could be addressed. And so we two years ago started to address this by building an offline BMET or biomedical technology library um, filled with manuals for all of the medical equipment that we possibly can get so that it doesn't sit unused because it was a mystery of, of how to make it work or how to fix it. Laura? And yes. Can, can we wrap here? We, uh, there's some questions. Yes, yes. Sure, I, so we've also been working on an agricultural library. Bruce has been spearheading that. A Spanish language library, um, a new look for the case that can um, allow us to scale. And I can, I'll, I'll wrap it there. But the one thing that I do wanna point out, the half the world that's still offline is not a monolith, right? They have different needs different skill sets. And so we believe that there's room for building up skills so that people eventually become savvy internet users. Um, but they're not born with these skills. All right, I can wrap it up there. <laughs> All right, fascinating story uh, uh, backed up by you know, some serious uh, data and uh, just some heroic efforts there uh, by your team. Uh, the <clears throat> The point about the hazards of the internet are, is, is well made, and not just for newbies. I mean, of course, you know, you, is that is that bank account being offered to me in Nigeria real? I, I don't know. But for people that have been on it, I mean, all of us are being uh, manipulated and tricked, uh, uh, certainly uh, influenced by these, you know, more ever more sophisticated algorithms. 
Uh, your point about Facebook is, 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 of course, a really interesting one. I mean, a kind of terrifying one, but uh, super interesting. Don't, aren't there a lot of phones out there? Is it, isn't that how people think of the internet is that, you know, this thing, this digital thing for their phone and there, there are more phones, right? I mean, do you have data on phones? A lot of people say, well, if everybody has a phone, they're connected. We know that's not really meaningful. I mean, try to write a paper on your phone, uh, but that doesn't mean it's not valuable. Uh, do you have any sense of how many people, how many people are just, you know, exposed to only Facebook because of the phone? It has it preloaded or? Our data could be considered anecdotal, but that's what every one of our interviewees has told us is that they're only getting, you know, they will go and buy one Vatu or fill in the currency of data and use it up by watching a YouTube video or what or getting on Facebook and communicating with their friends. Um, we also ask even about being able to do a Google search and the number of people who, so it's 100% Facebook and the number of people who can actually carry out a Google search or have heard of Google goes down to about 30%. So wow. bad news for Google, I guess. But if, um, I mean, yeah, it, it has to, well, okay, Don, honestly, I feel that this is what we get when we have privatized what is a public good, which is access to information. So this isn't surprising. This is what the market demands. I mean, we have for-profit companies that aren't built for providing human, uh, these are human rights that we're talking about. They're also public goods, right? Access to information, access to primary education even, but that for-profit yeah. companies aren't built to provide public goods. And so they are built to make profits. And so we're going to continue to see things out there that are going to bring in profit and expecting them to do otherwise is silly. It's counter intuitive it, it doesn't so it is absolutely other entities that need to step in to be able to provide public goods i agree with you that it's the governments who need to be doing more and better but in fact that is one of the primary reasons we created government to, was to do that very thing uh yes. to act in our common interests and you know, it, it, it's difficult because, uh, you know, the technology moves so quickly to try to even uh, regulate it. You have to define it. A lot of these phenomena are emerging so quickly, you can't even name them. And if you can't name them, how can you write any kind of descriptive uh, control measures around them? It's a, it's a classic technology challenge. Uh, we have a question here uh, from Roger uh, Rustad. Roger's with the Information Technology Disaster Resource Center, and they are an outstanding group that, that go in wherever there are outages, which is another aspect of this uh, offline that uh, you really talked about places where the internet has never been or it's just slightly there, but there are places where it has existed and it's gone and then people are, are suddenly in the same boat as they, they don't have uh, access. But Roger asked this question about darknet libraries. Uh, are you familiar with library genesis or these other things? Well, nor am I. Uh, maybe Gregoire is, or somebody can do some research and, and give us some more information there. Um, one question I want to have for you before we go over to Gregoire is uh, uh, networks around these devices, like wide area, community scale networks, how these, how these grow? Is it, there, are they just like with just a Wi-Fi zone, and that's pretty much the scale of the of the solar spell uh, environment and then a link to the internet or can it, does it grow and include, you know, a whole village or, or how, how does it? So, that, so Don, I think you can think of what the approach to solar spell has been a, a, is a library for, at a school. It isn't linking ever to the internet because the internet doesn't exist in those places. And just to back up a little bit on your comment on the phones, the other thing that the fallacy that most people believe in the West is, you know, I can fly into uh, Uganda and be in Kampala and yes, look at my phone. I got 3G coverage. Why I don't under, everybody has 3G, but as soon as you drive out from the capital in any African country or developing country, 
um, you drop down, down to 2G and in the rural areas, 3G just doesn't exist. And so it's kind of a fallacy to think, oh, well, people have a smartphone, they can, you know, be surfing the web. Well, the reality, once you're out of the major cities, that's not true. Uh, it's, it's, it's somewhat uh, not true in the U.S. or in a lot of developing places. There are big holes in the cell coverage. Uh, exactly. And, yeah. um, you know, just... Affordability. To, you know, I mean, you haven't even touched on affordability. The, the... Yeah, yeah. So, um, so no, there's in where we're going, we're focused on education in those schools, not building out community networks. All right, I understand. That's, you know, first things first, absolutely. Right. Exactly. exactly. So, uh, Gregoire, thank you for your patience. Uh, and also thank you for coming. Uh, Gregoire is actually on vacation <laughs> right now, but he is taking time out from, uh, we hope your, your, uh, partner is giving you permission, I guess so, because you're here. And we're appreciative of that, Gregoire. So uh, tell us what's happening and what's new with Bibliothèque Sans Frontières and the great work you guys have been doing. Welcome. Welcome back. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for the invitation, uh, Don. And uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to say a few uh, words about uh, the world's presentation. I couldn't agree more with what has uh, been said uh, earlier about the necessity uh, that, that just offline internet is not just a tool. So uh, yes, a re really congratulations. It's, uh, it summarizes everything we, <laughs> we think we, and believe at the Library Without Borders. Um, well, today, uh, since the, thank you uh, once again for the invitation. And uh, since uh, it's uh, about uh, offline internet, I, I I didn't choose to talk about uh, Library Without Borders, but uh, I chose uh, to play as a team player and to talk uh, about offline internet and why it is uh, needed. Uh, since uh, I, I thought that the, the title of the seminar, Offline Internet and Oxymoron, was uh, very inspiring. Um, so uh, when we talk about uh, offline internet, uh, the first thing to do is maybe to, to have a definition of, of, of uh, what is offline internet. Um, well, there's no really such thing as offline internet. Uh, we, we prefer to talk about sneakers, uh, sneakers internet. Why? Because um, in, in some countries, uh, and mainly uh, authoritarian countries, such as Cuba, for instance, I have this example, but there are uh, many other countries, uh, where you don't have access to internet, people still exchange information. And how do they do so? Uh, they do so using uh, flash drives or any, uh, any uh, drive where you can store information, and they exchange drives and in order to make in circulation, uh, the, the information circulate. They use their legs, their feet, and this is why we call that sneaker nets. So sneaker nets and internet offline has been there for uh, many, many years, and uh, actually since computer exists. However, uh, since uh, a few uh, days, a few years, maybe now 10 years, many solutions uh, have been created by uh, many smart organizations, so large spells, uh, Kiwiks, Internet in a box, library without borders with OLIP, and uh, Sneaker Net has evolved a lot. So now you don't need a flash drive. Uh, you need uh, a server, a small computer. So I don't know what kind of hardware you use at SolarSpell, um, a Raspberry Pi. So as you can see on the picture, it's a Raspberry Pi, and uh, it's a small hardware that costs less than $100 that can fit in your hand. And the principle of uh, internet is that you um, you put a lot of uh, content on uh, the hard drive of the server and when you have an internet connection then you go somewhere with your sneakers where you don't have an internet connection and this uh, raspberry pi this card creates a wi-fi network and people can access to uh, the content and not just one people who would have to plug a flash drive on his or uh, her computer or smartphone, but up to 20, 45 people. This is uh, what uh, sneaker, led, sneaker net is uh, nowadays. Um, so 
The question is, do we really need internet offline? So uh, since uh, Laura uh, made a great uh, presentation, you, you all know that, sorry for that. You all know that the answer is yes, but I just want to emphasize a, a few things. Um, well, we really can ask the question because, uh, uh, yes, I, I won't say again what you have uh, said already, Laura, more than half of the world population is not connected. And this number reaches 80% in Africa. So I speak about Africa because uh, in at Library Without Borders, we have a lot of projects uh, in, 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 uh, in Burundi and in the Democratic, Democratic Republic of Congo. So um, the thing is that the greatest minds of our century, I, and I'm thinking about some Google engineers and the great Elon Musk, uh, these people have launched some very brilliant projects uh, you may have heard about. Uh, for instance, Google Loons and Starlink. So what is Google Loon? Google Loon is, is a project that started in uh, uh, 2013. And it's, uh, you know, um, it's a project from uh, Google who is about creating a mesh network using loons that are launched uh, in the sky. Uh, that helped people to that, that would the idea was to allow people to create a mesh network and internet access uh, in areas where it was very difficult to bring um, towers and everything you need to, to, to create an internet connection. So the project started in 2013 and it stopped in 2021. Actually, the project was stopped a few weeks ago. So um, let's talk about Starlink. So Starlink is uh, one of the many uh, companies that uh, owns uh, uh, Elon Musk, uh, this guy. So uh, Starlink is a project which is about creating a mesh network using uh, low orbit satellites and um, to bring internet everywhere on the planet. So Starlink actually might succeed because uh, you don't need a very expensive hardware. You don't need uh, the, the connection is quite uh, it's, uh, equi equivalent 4G or 3G. So it's quite fast. It's, uh, it's interesting. However, uh, well, and it's only $99 a month. Well, I say only. The problem is uh, how many people in the world can afford to pay $99 a month for an internet connection? And the answer is not that much because half of the world population lives with less than $4 a day. So when you live with less than $4 a day, you just have other things in your mind than to access internet. So um, Google, Starlink, and many other companies, they have tried since decades uh, with a lot of money to bring internet everywhere on the planet and they still have not succeeded. And actually my bet is that they never will. They never will succeed in that. Uh, it's not because they are not good. They are very clever people. However, they don't, don't want to. And then I'm, I'm going to go back to uh, Google Loons. Actually, the, this is a, a quote from uh, Astro Teller. Uh, Astro Teller is uh, the, his title uh, is a uh, moonshot captain. And Moonshot is the, um, uh, the unit uh, in Google who is uh, in charge of, of uh, very promising uh, projects such as, uh, for instance, Google Loons. So he explained in an, uh, in an article on Medium, and the link uh, is here, that the road to commercial viability has proven to be much longer and riskier than hope. So internet offline, uh, internet everywhere, uh, it's not economically viable. So I think, uh, this is my bet once again, I'm, I'm, not a, uh, I'm not a magician, but I guess I think I'm convinced that um, internet everywhere, this is something that will not happen. Um, so this is why internet offline is the future. Uh, and I, I, I will quote three, uh, reasons why I really think, and at the Library Without Borders, and in, at the, in the OLI consortium, we think that Internet of Fine 
is the future. Uh, and I won't mention every uh, good reasons Laura has already given, uh, who, uh, which are about um, uh, curation of content and everything. So one of the one of the first reason is that uh, internet uh, offline is cheap, much cheaper than Starlink. Starlink might seem to be cheap. Uh, it's uh, still it's nineteen hundred dollars a month every month, and you need to buy a five hundred dollar hardware to access to uh, the Starlink network. Uh, it's privacy focused, and I, I, I'll come into that uh, later. And it's safe actually, and it's community oriented. Uh, so it's cheap. Why? Because if, <laughs> if we go back to the history of the sneaker net, uh, a flash drive is only $10. Uh, but if you want to use more advanced solutions such as a solar pair, so, solar pair or uh, Olive or Kiwix or Internet in a box, all those solutions are have been created by members of the offline uh, consortium of uh, Internet Offline Consortium. All these solutions run on cheaper that costs on, on sorry on 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 hardware that costs less than one hundred dollars. Uh, you can use a Raspberry Pi and, and you just pay one dollar one hundred dollars once and that's it. You have internet for well internet offline a sneaker net for twenty to thirty people. Uh, it's privacy focused, so um, I, I just want to, to 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 say a few words about that. Uh, as librarians, I guess there, there are many librarians here uh, in the public. Uh, preserving the privacy of the vulnerable po population we work with uh, should be a high priority for all of us. For instance, at Library Without Borders, we work a lot with refugees. I, I will tell a few stories about that in a few minutes. Uh, we work with population uh, who, who are um, uh, far from, uh, uh, who have some difficulties to access to information. And 80% of our project, uh, we, we, we run this project with vulnerable population. So we have a duty to protect this population. And I won't talk about Facebook, uh, uh, about fake news, about Cambridge Analytica scandal, or about Serbian capitalism, if you want to, uh, uh, to have a, a deeper look at what is surveillance capitalism, capitalism which is making money uh, uh, with the data of their users. Uh, I suggest uh, a very good uh, book, which is Surveillance Capitalism by Sochana Zuboff, which is a great, great book about that. So um, internet right now, it's, it's not a safe place for everybody. And internet offline is a safe place because the best way not to be tracked online is to stay offline. Uh, internet and sneaker net uh, is also community oriented and uh, even more than community oriented, I would, I would, uh, I, I should have written uh, content uh, and curation uh, oriented. Um, I'm going to give you two figures. Uh, two numbers. Uh, I've checked for this presentation the number of articles in Wikipedia in English. There are more than, uh, there, there are around six million, uh, a little bit less than six million articles on Wikipedia in English. Uh, and if you check uh, articles in Linguala, Linguala is a language uh, that you speak in Democratic uh, Republic of Congo. And uh, the fact is that not everybody speaks English in the world. And, I, and, and, and even people like me can speak English. As you can hear, I have a very strong accent and uh, I, I'm not always uh, very comfortable with English. Um, so in Ninguala, uh, which is a language uh, spoken in, 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 in uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, of Congo, there are only three, a little bit more than 3,000 articles uh, in Ninguala in Wikipedia. So um, at Library Without Borders, uh, I'm, so a small, small, small story, at Library Without Borders, we, we, we use OLIP, the, which is a offline internet solution or uh, preferably a sneaker net internet solution. We use OLIP for our projects in Bangladesh. In Bangladesh, we work in refugee camps uh, with uh, with Rohingyas, uh, Rohingyas that have been um, uh, 
uh, chased from China and many people, many Rohingyas are uh, refugees and there are huge camps uh, in Bangladesh. So we did not find uh, many resources in Rohingya uh, on the internet. So what we had to do, and uh, this worked, uh, we, 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 we have a team there and we created these resources um, directly in, with the Rohingya community inside the camps. We um, created digital resources and we put those digital resources on our Olive server, on our internet server. And then all the um, uh, Rohingya in the camps, well, between 20 and 30 uh, at the same time, were able to access to these uh, resources. And everything, uh, all that we have done was done offline because in refugee camps, uh, refugees are forbidden to, 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 to use internet connection. We couldn't, even if we had an internet connection, we couldn't, uh, we couldn't, we couldn't do that because we, uh, the, the, the authorities of the country wouldn't uh, let us do that. So this could occur only thanks to internet offline. Um, and uh, OLIP, the, 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 the solution we use for this internet, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a small server and we, it's, it's a digital library actually. And Library Without Borders creates uh, content with uh, local communities, uh, Rohingyas, uh, or uh, resources in Linguala. And now we have around uh, 50,000 content and 200 websites, because we can also install websites uh, on Olive servers in uh, around 15 languages. That's, that's great. That's good. It allows uh, us to work with uh, Rohingyas, with people uh, speaking uh, Linguala. Uh, for instance, that's great, but it's not enough. Um, actually, what will make SNCC SNC Internet great is what has already made Internet great. This is, and it will be the availability for everyone to create uh, their own content. So this is actually what we plan to do this year with Oli. Um, our, strategy, our strategy now is to open our library of offline content to every organization, because we really believe that uh, SneakerNet will succeed only if you have relevant content for communities. So we have a project uh, which will um, uh, hopefully, uh, <laughs> I hopefully it will be done uh, this year. We will create a non, an online uh, interface. So you will be able to access to, to your website to upload your um, digital resources. And this website will turn these resources in uh, OLIP package that you will be able to download and install on OLIP. Because we 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 we, we had the idea that um, alone only a library without borders we won't succeed in creating enough content. So this is why our main focus now, our main strategy, is to make uh, internet as great as internet and to allow anyone to contribute to uh, the internet library. Um, thank you very much. This is all I wanted to say about um, Olip. Uh, and uh, sorry once again for my hesitation in English, but if you have any question, I'll be happy to answer those. Thank you. Uh, Don, I think you're mute. Indeed, I am. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, once again, an excellent presentation of, of an approach and a, uh, we could say a philosophy of, of information. Uh, you've, you've uh, similar to uh, Laura and, and Solar Spell, have touched on the value of uh, content, local content, in, in the context of uh, culture and location. and so what, what question kind of comes up is uh, related to communication. So the Facebook fascination, as Laura pointed out, that people have is to communicate with other people. You know, did you see that 
Buffalo that came up. Did you did you hear about the, the woman who, you know, had three babies, you know, all the kinds of things that humans just want to share with each other, uh, especially with family or maybe not only, but increasingly people who are spread out and, and not locally. So I'm curious how the communications application, what you've helped identify, we, we use the internet all the time and we're doing both communication, accessing content, generating content, but those are kind of separated when we're talking about, you know, what, what a text message does and, and sending email or even forwarding an article as, as a type of a communication. So what is the communication application in, in both your scenarios? Uh, maybe Greg, why you can talk about that. How do, how do people use uh, OL, OLIP to communicate with each other? Well, um, Snikomati is, is useful, but I mean, it, it, it answers to uh, a different needs than the internet. And um, when it comes to communication between people who are uh, far, far, far away from each other, um, as far as I know, there are no easy solution that would rely on the Snikomati uh, philosophy. Uh, we have been asked many times, and I will be very interested in having a solar cell answer uh, and you about that. We have been asked many times, okay, I would like to uh, be able to communicate using a server with uh, some people uh, abroad and to create a mesh network and blah, blah, blah. And we didn't go through this path because it's very different uh, than what we do. What we do is we provide content that have been selected for a specific audience. And it's very different than providing a way to communicate. And so far, we don't have any um, satisfying answers uh, for what you just asked them. OK, OK, OK. Uh, Laura, does, does, does demand for communication impede what you're trying to do with, with uh, content? and? You know, those, no, those... it doesn't. So I would agree 100% with Gregoire. We get asked that all the time, but I like to remind people that what we're talking about is a library. So it's not a, a the internet. <laughs> and we're, I mean, so when people go to a library and check out books, are they communicating with each other in the way that you just described, Don? Right, so it's, and there is a huge beauty to being able to um, keep, people safe, as, as Gregoire was saying, that I, I, I'm sorry to, to even bring this up, but the number of pornography stories that I could share with this um, group that we hear about when people are first getting on the internet and whoops, that came up. And then the whole community decides no more internet, it's evil. Um, so it's it's really important. <laughs> no, the the hazards are the hazards are real and growing. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. we've been we've been working in this for some time with this objective of you know how do we connect everybody? How do we allow everybody an opportunity to connect? Yeah. And increasingly over the period that period of time, you know, last ten years or so, the 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 number and the sophistication of hazards and pitfalls has grown exponentially. Absolutely. Yeah. And now it feels like, well, are we not leading lambs to slaughter? Well, okay, you know, there's a, there's a real case for that. And I think you both have presented scenarios which respond to that as a, as a cautionary way. We have also been exploring, we just started a, a, a couple of weeks ago, a thread through the series around AI and libraries in response to AI and how it affects these algorithms, these, these machine learning tools are both uh, the, the vehicle for these manipulations and may also be uh, part of a solution to that. And, and one of the ones that's come up is the potential for, the, for AI to be distributed out towards the edge. If you are distributing content out toward the edges of the network or even off the network, uh, what kind, of, what kind of tools can libraries represent? What kind of services can libraries rent, represent that act as intermediaries and, and the curators, as they already do, of content in that scenario? So there's a lot to delve into, but giving people opportunities to, to learn and build educational 
institutions is really what I'm getting from what you're providing that is a nucleus for uh, a human activity around information, useful information to happen everywhere. I think that's just a wonderful thing that you're all doing. We're, we've run over a little bit, we often do, but only by a few minutes. Um, after we close the recording part of the session, we, we just hang around for a while, uh, just for open mic and chat. But before we close, uh, I'd like to ask if anybody would uh, has any other questions they'd like to put to our speakers uh, before we do that. Uh, yes, the surveillance capitalism. Yes, absolutely. It is something that we have to deal with. And it looks like governments are about the only thing we have to do that. I don't see... I don't see an alternative uh, force that, would, that matches the, the size and power of these enormous, the largest companies that have ever existed uh, are in effect the monopolists of an inf infrastructure. Uh, you mentioned uh, Starlink, Gregoire, uh, and you also mentioned the cost. I, you know, yes, I'm sure there are a lot of people you know, in my neighborhood that would think that $100 a month is, uh, outrageous, and, and if not uh, unaffordable, but could, could a, a link like that into a village, you know, hazards notwithstanding, could a village not afford uh, $100 somewhere if they could share that uh, down link? Now, uh, we must not oppose uh, Synthonet and the uh, internet, because uh, to leave Synthonet needs uh, the internet, and I think that the Starlink uh, connection uh, combined with uh, a device such as uh, Olip, SolarSpell, or SkyReserve, is a great, great solution. That means uh, you can imagine that the community will pay for $100 each month, and in that you will have brand deals, and everybody uh, will benefit from the downloads because Sniffernet is more about caching uh, digital resources. So that would be uh, a good complement uh, of some uh, Sniffernet solutions. That's a great point about sort of asynchronous uh, uh, communication as opposed to live. And that, that slows down the ability of people to, you know, make mistakes, uh, even if it's maybe a little less convenient. Uh, we could imagine this service connecting the world's 400,000 libraries as a, you know, an interesting thing to, to think about anyway. And uh, we may even have them on one of these days. Um, um, so, Tom, uh, one, yeah, one, go ahead. One, one closing thought from, from me is the other part that hasn't been discussed here is um, we always talk about a di digital divide and getting affordable internet to these libraries. However, the other part is there's also an energy divide. And if you look at where there is not electricity, there is not the internet. And so, yes, I could find the $1,000 to buy the Starlink equipment and the $100 a month service fee, but if I don't have electricity to run it, it doesn't do much good. I think they're coming in at around 150 watts. So I don't know what size solar unit and battery would be required for that, but maybe that's another, it, you're absolutely right about uh, this being a critical <laughs> component of any kind of uh, digital reality is, is power. Uh, and so those have to be solved. I know you guys have such lightweight solutions that it's, uh, uh, you know, that there's a small panel can drive these systems and which is a great engineering. I've got my hands on it. I highly recommend it. Do you, do you have any more resources you'd like to put in the chat as well uh, for people to refer to? Um, Laura, I'm gonna ask you for a, a last word as well. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm actually going to echo a lot of what Gregoire just said, that we're not opposed to the internet. We very much, you know, eagerly await the day when everyone is connected, but we feel that the skills need to be built so that people are making meaningful use of the internet so that it's realizing its potential, its promise, and that isn't going to happen with private sector driving a for-profit model of the internet. It has to be done elsewise, and we can do it offline, and we can do it now. Okay, the, the utility model, I think, uh, is a very strong case for that. I mean, these are infrastructures that necessarily depend upon the, the common and public rights of way, whether those are 
physical uh, pathways or the, the public airwaves. And so you make a strong case there. Gregoire, any last uh, comment? How's your vacation going otherwise? <laughs> well, I'm on vacation in Paris, uh, where I live since, uh, you know, with the COVID situation, you can't uh, really, uh, really travel. But um, I, I won't, uh, those won't be my final words uh, about my vacation. <laughs> no, no, I, I really wanted to say a few words about um, internet and the offline internet. Uh, I, I will really believe it's the future, uh, as explained uh, earlier. But I mean, it's all also about being, uh, I don't know if it's the correct word in English, a uh, frugal. Fr frugal? Um, mm -hmm. uh, it's a frugal solution. Uh, yeah. And I mean, it, it, in, uh, sneaker nets in the internet offline will consume less energy, less hardware. And this is the future. I mean, we, we, we are in a, in a, in a world where we know that we consume too much and you can't put a, a internet everywhere. Not everybody can have internet everywhere because uh, not all the world will be able to live with the same model as we have in Western countries. So at some point we have to find new solution, new paths. And I really think that sneaker net is one of those new paths and clever and intelligent paths. Well, great. Uh, we're, we're likely to find out if if that's correct. So uh, before we close, I'd like to ask everybody to unmute, if you would, just unmute for a second, everyone, please. Eric, everyone, if you can click off on your, your mute. Uh, we'd like to give our presenters a round of applause. This is an extraordinary presentation. Thank you very much. Just great stuff, really. Okay, with that, we'll close. We'll hope you'll come back next week. We've got uh, another exciting uh, program on tap. So thank you all, and we'll see you next week. Yeah.